Good afternoon, my name is Peter McCaig. I'm, uh, I work for the uh, Historic Environment Scotland. We're uh, <coughs> an organisation formed two years ago from uh, the uh, com combining the functions of the Royal Commission of Historical Monuments of Scotland, which is very much a research and archive agency with the regulatory um, designations, casework side uh, in Historic Scotland. And Historic Scotland also has a much wider remit in managing properties and care, conservation of monuments and things. This talk is very much from the perspective of what was the National Monuments Record, what is now the National Record for the Historic Environment in Scotland as opposed to England. Uh, we started out based on a card index from the Ordnance Survey, the Ordnance Survey is Britain's National Mapping Agency. They used to depict maps, uh, they used to depict archaeological sites on maps. Is there a pointer? Uh, so, so this is the, 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 the Hillford Chesters and they, they would select some of the antiquities and, and uh, put them on the map. Don't look at those. They don't work on the screen. Don't see the point. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. So the, the, we used to put monuments on, 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 on maps <coughs> and we still have that role of supplying information to the Ordnance Survey. It's very much decreased these days. Um, but there's a lot more to the archaeological landscape than uh, monuments. We've, we've got a crop mark programs. So we've transcribed the, 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 the archaeological landscape as revealed by crop marks. There's a series of pit alignments, settlements that are ploughed out. And this is all information that we hold in our national monuments record. This information isn't actually accessible online for very much of Scotland. We've just released some of it uh, this year on, on to Canmore. Um, just to the, the corporate slide, this is Historic Environment Scotland. We're the lead body for uh, Historic Environment in Scotland, uh, in charge with uh, delivering our place and time to Historic Environment Strategy. So we're, we, we're, we want to make the environment strong, we want to make a strong contribution to the cultural, social, and envir environmental and economic well-being of the nation and its people. That's under better known, understood, and appreciated, uh, and it's properly cared for and protected, and that people value celebrate and enjoy the historic environment and we've got very law and we've got several um, citizen science programs going out actually working with the community to record information that then feeds back into the national record uh, we have a various number of drivers to keep keep our information up to date and accessible so obviously there's the Valletta convention about making maintaining an inventory of the archaeological heritage we call it the national monuments record national record of historic environment and the designations, the, 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 those areas that are legal charges, the scheduled monuments, the listed buildings, guards design, designed landscapes that we, we designate. But we also, um, as I say, we maintain the inventory. We, we have increasingly a large number of commercial archaeological units working across Scotland. So there's about 500 archaeological projects a year reported uh, through Discovery and Excavation. There's probably another 400 pieces of fieldwork reported from the community groups, from individual researchers. Uh, that all contribute into Canmore in one way or another. And we add that information as events into the national database. But the database is set up as a monuments record for first and foremost. We can say, show me all the excavations in Scotland, which is a limitation at present. And again, it's about ensuring and uh, making information accessible. So let's carry on. We also have the Inspire Directive, which uh, sets out uh, to, 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 to free up information to allow, to, to share environmental information, to help sh uh, make positive uh, uh, impact on the policies and activities that affect the environment. Historic environment is sort of in it, it's sort of, it's in the protected sites annex, but it's not very clear and there's a lot of wriggle room that allows you to say, well, my data doesn't, it's not formally protected sites, so, so we can exclude. We, we took the view very early on that it was all historic environmental uh, data and it's managed through other effective means it's managed through the planning system through the archaeologists and the planning system so it does have a positive impact and we work with our local authority colleagues to try and get their data online we also have an open data driver to make information accessible through uh, open licenses so that people can reuse the data without an uh, undue um, barrier Open data was one of the things that allowed uh, us to actually <coughs> publish our map data online very early on. The Ordnance Survey insisted that we released our data as open data for the Inspire web services. So we see that again as a very positive thing by allowing people to work with and engage with the data. So since 1998, 
we've had our national record online through Cam Moore, and this is probably the fourth iteration of the of the website. It started out very much as a text-based search. You'd search the type of monument, the name of the site, that kind of thing. It's now been expanded to include geographic searches and allows you to search on collections that are deposited within the um, in the archive. So you could say, show me all the archive from Gordon Child, if that's a collection. This is just a, a result showing three three Roman sites from uh, the Lothians in, uh, just outside Edinburgh. And uh, we, 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 we can now download the data. It's very limited data. It's not the full act. It's not full the full data set. It gives you enough to find out what the site is, the coordinates of where it, uh, where it is, and a link to the, the full record on, uh, on CAM, so that people can take that CSV, drop it into their own GIS and use it if they so wish. And we also have a KML feed as well to drop the sites onto uh, Google Earth. As I say, we've got a mapping interface, which has got, uh, we through, through the um, Inspire and One Scotland mapping agreement, we were able to bring in uh, Ordnance Survey map backgrounds, historic map backgrounds managed by the National Library for Scotland and an ortho imagery area, area layer from Get Mapping PLC. As I say, we also work with our local authorities who hold a lot of, it's the same situation in England where there's uh, information, both the national and local records. We're, we're probably a bit closer together in Scotland, it's a smaller country, and we do manage concordance between a lot of the data sets. But we, we, we work by, uh, with the local authorities to ensure that the data is improved, that the data standards and consistency are rolled out, and trying to deliver efficiency through data creation, reporting, etc. And again, very importantly, the training, the promotion of the standards that we try and encourage people to, to think about what the terms mean and use them in the same way. Uh, again, we have PassMap, which is a co collaborative portal combining various data sets. So it's bringing together the National Monuments Record data set, the Scheduled Monuments, the statutory data sets that Historic Environment Scotland maintain, and the local authority data sets. And that's published online. Uh, it's viewable. It has the same download facility. You can select an area and you're, you're able to then download a CSV file of, of data sets. This is combining data from uh, the historic environment record, from scheduled monuments, from Camel. It's very homogenized. It, it's stripped down to very simple things. It's the name, it's the coordinates, and a link out to the relevant resource. So it's a way of signposting future information in whichever uh, data set. As I said, PassMap contains the uh, designation data. We can also through, oops, yeah. So uh, again, because of Inspire, we've been an obligation to make a protected sites data available online. So this Heritage Director of the Historic Environment of Scotland has launched the Heritage Portal, which allows you to find out metadata about the site, access the WMS, the Web Map Service, Web Feature Service, Atom feeds, and download a zipped up shape file of the designated data sets. As part of our obligations for Inspire, we, we create a record in the Scottish Spatial Data Infrastructure Portal, that's a snappy name. Uh, but on that, you can go and find out information about which service, which data sets are available. This is a local node for Scotland, which is then harvested to data.gov in the UK. So that's uh, that one. And then on that, the other side is the Inspire Geo Portal. So the information is fed into the SSDI, it's harvested to data.gov and then it's sped up into the Inspire Geo portal where it may or may not appear depending on the connections and <laughs> updates as I tried to find this and I couldn't find the example when I was, when I was putting this together. So this is great for all the, all the sort of formal information that we create, the information that we gather and the information that we get, the designated data sets, but there's a lot more spatial information created in Heritage than just those data sets. So briefly look at uh, the range of primary data sets from the crop mark interpretation, remote sensing data sets and the interpretation of those data sets, field survey, excavation, laser scanning, and also the scientific analysis, the radiocarbon dates. So there's a wealth of other information that we don't formally gather. It's, it's in the national record, but it's not very accessible, and we certainly don't have the spatial footprints for all the excavations. We've got some of the crop marks mapped, and we're just cleaning them up and trying to publish them. We also have to deal with uh, a lot of new data sets, the new technologies, the structure for motion, laser scanning, as how do you deal with those data sets and it's the metadata that describes them. We're also dealing with scale, we've gone from a very much a sort of postage stamp 
uh, geophysical survey, uh, a small site in the field, to a massive area landscape survey of the uh, Heart of Orkney World Heritage Site. Uh, and these bring a lot of challenges about presenting that information, accessing that information, and actually also archiving and dealing with the long-term preservation. And the, the archive is wrapped up with the, um, the, meta, the discovery metadata. It's all part of a continuum. And as I say, it's metadata. It's, uh, it's the making sure the, the metadata describes the nature and the content of the data set, the information to, uh, to allow you to assess whether you can use the data, whether, whether the data set's appropriate for purpose, and again, the access rights, the um, whether it's under an open license, etc. Just the, the 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 ability to reuse that data. As I say, we we started to publish our um, aerial photographic transcriptions. So we've released uh, Lovins. So uh, lost the marker. Uh, this is showing the crop marks against the aerial photography uh, layer and historic mapping. Might might cycle through. It requires applying a, a data standard to the, that line work so it's consistent across data sets, which is fine. We, 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 we're, we're, we're the main organisation that maps the, the area of photography, so we can apply, apply our own standards. But for a lot of the other data sets, that, that's information that's created from the third party, and that's a lot harder to, to apply standards. So take the points earlier about different um, uh, data schemas and things. We use an online form called OASIS, which uh, the, the commercial archaeological units use to feed in the information about their project to the to the to, through the OASIS to the local authority curators ourselves, and then the information is published on the ADS Great Literature Web uh, Library. This captures information to a standard uh, format, so you have got a degree of standardization that allows you to describe the project. What it's not very good at is capturing the spatial information. People can upload boundary files, but they don't have to, and they don't necessarily understand what they're doing. So, so we need to work with the, um, the, the, the people who are actually creating the data, the primary source of the information, to try and encourage a data standard there. Let's say, open data is great. We can release t CSV files, text files, whatever tables, but the spatial information, it just sits in a report. That, that, that file cannot be taken and combined with the serve in the next field without having to re-digitize. So we need to move into a world where we're actually digitizing, we're, we're working with the, the contractors to say, this is information that's valuable. We can store it, we can generate, we can provide those services out, but you need to provide the data. So, now just to conclude, uh, we've been very proactive in publishing uh, the spatial data. Uh, it's certainly uh, a steer that we want to have our information accessible so people know the heritage that is there. Inspire is a, is a driver for making the protected sites data available and the data should be harmonised and readily available through WMS, WFS so that whoever wants to use it can use it but we're missing the potential of the, uh, the primary data sets, we're just not harnessing what, what's there so you have got di diversity in the information gathered. As I said, the information, spatial information, so much of it's just locked in a PDF, it's actually very limiting what you can do with that information. So, as I say, there's a need for a coordinating uh, a pr approach to harness and standardise spatial data that, that goes across from the curators to, to those who are creating the information. Thank you.